the gauge, uh, bio, which is a biological age calculator. And I see Morgan on the call. So hi, Morgan. And uh, thanks for you. Thanks for, uh, you know, developing this tool because I use it so often. So, yeah, so I measured my blood test for the sixth time in 2021. And then uh, this uh, the Morgan's uh, biological age calculator includes uh, nine uh, blood test biomarkers as shown there, albumin, creatinine, glucose, et cetera. And then when you plug in that data in conjunction with your chronological age, uh, it gives you your biological age or which is otherwise known as phenotypic age, which in this case, in this test was 36.9, which was 12 years younger than my chronological. So the big question should be how good is this biological age calculator? So uh, uh, these nine biomarkers and chronological age, so that combination is strongly correlated with chronological age, which is shown here in this plot of phenotypic age or biological age. Uh, against chronological age. So you can see it's almost perfectly linear. And in two separate studies in NHANES 3 and NHANES 4, these are uh, US-based cohorts of uh, you know about 10,000 and 11,000 uh, subjects. The correlation for this biological age tool with chronological age was 0.94 in NHANES 3 and 0.96 in uh, NHANES 4. So a correlation of one is as uh, perfectly linear, that's as close as you can get, you know, uh, that's as good as it gets for uh, linearity. So 0.94 is very close to uh, almost perfectly linear. So how, how good does um, uh, Morgan's test compare with the best epigenetic clocks? Because I think when most people think about biological age, they don't think about these blood-based biomarker tools. They think straight away about epigenetic clocks. So the best performing epigenetic clock in terms of its correlation with uh, chronological age is the Horvath clock. And uh, this is a multi-tissue uh, clock that included uh, 15 different cell types, including, you know, just looking at the, the right side. So breast cells, cheek cells, brain cells, colon, blood, et cetera. And when using that multi-tissue clock, we can see that the co its correlation for uh, epigenetic age with chronological age is 0.94, which is basically identical or very similar, however you want to uh, look at it, to the Levine clock using the blood-based biomarkers. So uh, the Levine test uh, isn't just uh, strongly correlated with biological age, it's also uh, significantly associated with all-cause mortality risk or risk of death for all causes. So for, for every one year uh, increase for biological age, all-cause mortality risk increases by 9%. And this biological age, again, being using uh, the, the phenotypic age, so uh, Morgan's test. So this was true for all-cause mortality in a study of 11,000 plus people. You can see that hazard ratio for every one year increase in biological age, that hazard ratio increases by 9%. Now that was true whether uh, it was young, middle-aged or older adults. So for every one year increase in biological age using the beans test, we can see that um, uh, all-cause mortality risk increased by 13%, 10% and 8% in young, middle-aged and older adults. And these are significant uh, associations. So it's not just all cause mortality. We can also break that down into disease specific mortality and uh, having an older biological age using Levine's test was significantly uh, associated with uh, increased deaths from heart disease, cancer, lower respiratory disease, interestingly not cerebrovascular disease, uh, diabetes related mortality, and then uh, deaths from influenza or pneumonia. And then along those lines, uh, an older biological age from uh, uh, 2006 to 2010, so up to 14 years before the pandemic, was associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, or associated with an increased mortality risk in COVID-19 patients. And then last but not least, an older biological age using uh, Levine's test is associated with uh, an increased risk of death from kidney-related uh, issues, including nephritis and nephrosis. So while I just showed you data from my last test, while that's a good start, having data for many tests can provide for a more accurate picture. And I see a lot of people testing once a year and then posting their data and whether or not that's reflective of the full year, that, that's another story. So I'm gonna go through all of my data that I've uh, uh, gathered over the past few years. So I've measured, um, I have 15 blood tests since 2018 using Levine's test. And as we'll see in a bit, I have more data than 15 tests for a different biological age tool. So for more context, let, let's have a look at the other five biological age results that I have in 2021. And that's what's shown here. So Levine's biological age on the y-axis versus time. And starting from my uh, 36.9 on my last test, uh, it wasn't much different from test number five, but not as good as test number one, 32.7. So when taking the average of these six tests in 2021, uh, my average uh, biological age was 35.6. So then the obvious question should, should then be, how, how, does, how did these uh, biological age results compare with 2020 data? Because 
the goal that, you know, the, one of my goals is to slow biological aging or even, you know, stop it if, if possible for as long as possible. So what about 2020 data? So uh, my range for 2020 went from 33.5 of a low to as high as 39.8. But again, over those six tests, my average was 35.6. So just having two, two different average values, um, you know, we can assess whether they're statistically significantly different or not. So to assess that, I used a two sample t-test and we can see that they are not significantly different. So essentially I've got the same biological age using Levine's test year over year. Now note that I, I said I had 15 tests since 2018. These are 12 of them. So uh, I just started testing uh, for CRP because it's not included in the standard chem panel. It's something you have to order extra, at least here in the US. So I only have three tests from 2018 to 2019. And over those three tests over a two year span, my average Levine biological age was 36.1. So uh, at worst, you know, I've, I've flattened the uh, biological age for at least a two year period, but at best one could argue that I've reduced it over, over a three to four year period. Now note that uh, while I'm a big fan of Morgan's work and everything that she does, um, uh, even if all nine biomarkers stay the same year over year, biological age using this tool will increase by 0.9 years for every one year increase in chronological age. So to me, if I'm 80 and I have the biochemistry, the systemic biochemistry of a 20 year old, or at least it looks like that in the numbers, am I you know, up to 20 years younger than my chronological age or am I somewhere even younger than that? So uh, to account for that, I, I like to include other biological age tools, including aging.ai, which doesn't include chronological age in its model. So greater reductions for biological age are possible. So aging.ai is also free to use. And I should mention that I have uh, an Excel file as a downloadable link. Um, so if, if anyone out there is interested in calculating their own biological age, just uh, reach out and I'll send you that link and you can calculate your own uh, you know, biological age using Morgan Levine's test on your own. So uh, aging.ai 3.0 is also free to use. Uh, hopefully it stays that way. Um, uh, and you can find it at aging.ai. So for that test, it includes 19 biomarkers. And that's usually the biomarkers that are found on a standard chemistry panel in a complete blood count, CBC, which in the US is about a $35 test. And I should mention that uh, CRP is about a $45 test. So essentially for $80, you can run two different biological age or blood-based biological age, uh, use two different tools. So aging.ai is strongly correlated with biological age without including chronological age in its model. And that's what we can see there with its correlation of 0.8 for chronological age. But note that it's not as strong as Levine's test. Uh, so what about its association with all-cause mortality risk? Well, biological ages that were younger than their corresponding chronolo chronological age were associated with reduced all-cause mortality risk. And this is true in a Canadian cohort. So for people that had biological ages that were greater than five years older than their chronological age, we can see a significantly increased um, all-cause mortality risk is shown there. And then uh, conversely, people that had biological ages that were five years younger than their chronological age had a significantly reduced all-cause mortality risk as shown there. And that data is basically uh, the same in a U.S. cohort, uh, in this case NHANES, uh, with similar value for the older biological ages with the increased all-cause mortality risk and the opposite data for people who had younger bio biological ages being associated with a reduced all-cause mortality risk. All right, so what's my data? So here's the my data for my blood test number six. That's the test that I got done about a month ago. And when entering all of these values into aging.ai 3.0, I get a biological age of 29 years, which is pretty close to 20, 19.9 years than my chronological age. So for more context, just like we did with the Levine's test data, let's have a look at previous data for aging.ai age, because one blood test is interesting, but more data can help tell the more uh, complete story. So I've been, I've been blood testing as far back as 2009, and, or, and since then I've got uh, 30 blood tests. So from 2009 to two thir 2013, I was just going to the doctor once a year for my annual checkup, annual physical, and then recording that data in an Excel file. And over, the, over three tests over that five year span, my average aging.ai age was 32 years. Now note that I wasn't tracking diet, I wasn't, uh, you know, I was exercising of course, and. Um, uh, trying to be fit in general, that's always been a focus of mine, but uh, I wasn't as hardcore uh, until uh, starting in about 2015. And in 2015, I started diet tracking. And I'll talk more about that approach uh, in a slide or two. But since I've been diet tracking for the last six and a half years, I have a, I, I also decided to start blood testing more often with the idea that more data, again, will help me get closer to what the actual picture is. And then once I know what the actual picture is in terms of systemic biomarkers, I can then go after trying to optimize it. 
So over that six, the last six plus year uh, period, uh, my average biological age with two tests in 2016 was 28, 29.3 over four tests in 2017. Uh, it's hard to see because it's in yellow, so apologies for that. 29.5, six tests in 2018, 30.3 average, three tests in 2019, over six tests in uh, 2020, 31.3. Now it should be pretty obvious that these data are increasing in terms of biological age from 2016 to 2020. Now, fortunately, over six tests in 2021, I was able to at least slow that down uh, to uh, with an average of 29.8 over those six tests, which is definitely going in the right direction. So uh, over these 27 blood tests, since I started diet tracking, my average um, biological age using aging.ai is 29.9. And my chronological age over that period is between 45, uh, 43 and uh, 45, uh, 48 years old. So I'm about 15 to 20 years younger using uh, aging.ai consistently. So then the big question is, how am I doing it? So I'm going to co cover two aspects of that. Uh, I'm going to go through my diet and some aspects of, of why I do and include some of the things that I do. And then um, cardiovascular fitness metrics. So in terms of diet, what's the approach? So as I mentioned, uh, I've been tracking my intake since 2015, and that starts with a food scale. And I literally weigh, weigh everything. I weigh all my food. And then I enter those food amounts into Chronometer, and I'm not sponsored by Chronometer. There are other apps that can do uh, similar things. And then the chronometer's output data, I take that including macro and micronutrients and the individual food amounts, and I put that into a spreadsheet. And then with enough data for diet, fitness metrics, and blood biomarkers, and note that now I have up to 34 blood tests depending on the biomarker since 2015, I can investigate correlations between those variables and then followed by interventions aimed at optimizing the blood biomarkers, which I expect will minimize disease risk and maximize longevity. So what's my actual diet? So here we're looking at my average daily dietary intake from uh, November 1st, 2021 through 1212. And the reason those dates are important is because uh, November 1st was the uh, date of blood test number five and 1213 was the date for blood test number six. So this 42 day period is the period in between blood tests. So this is my average di daily dietary intake for a 42 day period that then corresponds to blood test number six. So for each blood test, I have an average dietary intake and with, with enough blood tests and enough average intake, you can start to look at correlations. So let's go through why I've, uh, I've got certain foods here and why they're important. So uh, atop the list are carotenoid rich foods. And that's because relatively higher blood levels of carotenoids are correlated with the younger biological age. In this case, it's uh, an epigenetic test called uh, Grim age. And so we can see that the higher the average level of carotenoids in blood, uh, as indicated by the bicor, so the uh, blue, the blue column that's significantly correlated with a younger epigenetic age and then more specifically carotenoids are uh, are subdivided into five main groups including lycopene alpha carotene uh, alpha, alpha carotene beta carotene lutein plus azanthin, and beta cryptoxanthin so each of those uh, individual carotenoids are also significantly correlated with a younger epigenetic age as shown in the bicor plot and the p-value for statistical significance so I try to have my diet uh, abundant in each of these five car uh, carotenoids. For example, watermelon, watermelon and tomatoes, and you can see that on the left, uh, you know, uh, how much I'm eating of them on a daily basis in terms of grams. Carrots are, are a rich source of alpha carotene, carrots and spinach, I get most of my beta carotene, spinach and parsley, I get most of my lutein and zeaxanthin, and then red, be red bell peppers is a pretty good source of beta cryptoxanthin. So also abundant in my diet are strawberries, second and second on the list. And one reason for that is because they're a rich source of fisetin, which extends median and maximal lifespan in mice. And that's what's shown here in this plot. So we're looking at percent survival against age. And when we, when we go to 50% survival, this is the time when half the population, mouse in this study, it's a mouse study, uh, half the population is dead and half is still alive. Uh, we can assess median survival and we can see that there's an increase in median uh, lifespan in the fisetin treated in the red line when compared with the control diet. Uh, and there's also, you can see there's an increase in the maximal lifespan here when compared with the controls too. All right, so also I've got uh, foods like blackberry and parsley. So why are they included? Uh, these foods contain dietary CD38 inhibitors. In parsley, it's apigenin, and in blackberries, it's curamanin. So why is that important? So here we're looking at a plot of activity versus age and uh, with NAD and CD38. So NAD, uh, which is a uh, metabolite that, that's involved in the health and functioning of virtually every oh. organ system in the body. NAD levels decline during aging is shown there. 
And then conversely, uh, CD38 levels increase during aging. And that's important because CD38 is an NADase, which means it degrades NAD. So one way to uh, help slow this down uh, is by including dietary CD38 inhibitors, again, apigenin and coromenin, which are found in parsley and blackberries. And then by including them, I expect to increase NAD or at worst to potentially slow the age-related NAD uh, decline. Now also abundant in my diet are mushrooms. We can see about 167 grams per day. And one reason for that is because they're a rich source of spermidine. So why is spermidine important? And uh, I should mention that I have videos on my YouTube channel for basically all of these things, you know, fisetin and carotenoids. So if you're interested in any uh, additional info, I'm just going to give the abridged version in this uh, presentation. But if you're interested in more info, my YouTube channel is a, a gold mine for everything else uh, going into this stuff, you know, more in depth. So spermidine extends lifespan. This is data in mice. Again, when looking at uh, median survival, we can see that uh, spermidine supplemented mice have an increased median uh, lifespan when compared with controls. Now, mushrooms are also a rich source, rich source of ergothionine, which uh, up until a few weeks ago uh, hadn't been assessed in terms of, it, in terms of its long, longevity, uh, potential longevity promoting effects in model organisms. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, a study was published in flies that shows that ergothionine extends lifespan in flies. And that's what's shown here. So again, looking at median survival, you can see that two doses of ergothionine significantly extended lifespan when can, compared with the controlled uh, fed flies in the uh, purple. So just going, so those data are in mice and flies. What about in humans? So here we're looking at all cause mortality risk, and this is for spermidine. Uh, so all cause mortality risk, cumulative incidence of death on the y axis uh, against follow up, so up to 20 years after a baseline assessment of spermidine intake. And what we can see is that the lowest uh, all cause mortality risk was for people that were consuming uh, a greater than 11.6 milligrams of spermidine per day with higher mortality risk for people who are consuming lower spermidine uh, intakes per day. So just from the mushrooms, I get more than uh, 11.6 milligrams per day. I get uh, 11.8 just from uh, mushrooms alone with smaller amounts in the rest of my diet. All right, now also note that for this, um, for this dietary period, I increased my intake of corn, oats, and barley. And uh, when you sum those three, it was 154 grams per day, which was only 30, about 32 grams per day for blood that corresponded to blood test number five. So I 5x my intake of those whole grains or, you know, or uh, starchy, you know, containing foods. So why did I do that? Why did I increase uh, whole grain intake for this blood test? So in order to answer that, uh, now it's time to look at some of my blood test data. So here's uh, data for glucose. And this is 32 blood tests over the past six plus years. And it's pretty clear to see that uh, it's been increasing over time. And more, more uh, specifically, blood glucose has been greater than 90 uh, milligrams per deciliter for 15 consecutive tests. So what may be impacting glucose? So to assess that, I can look at, again, look, I can look at correlations for my diet with the blood biomarkers and then alter um, you know, stuff in my diet in, the, in an attempt to optimize blood biomarkers, including glucose. So uh, this is correlations for macronutrients. We'll start there with glucose. So let's start with what's not significantly uh, correlated with glucose, and that's calorie intake as shown there with the R correlation coefficient and the p-value. It's not statistically significant. And then the strongest correlation for uh, blood glucose is with fat, a higher average uh, daily fat intake. So the higher my fat intake, that's significantly correlated with a higher glucose. And co conversely, the higher my carbohydrate intake, that's significantly correlated with lower glucose. And uh, note that, uh, again, this is for 32 dietary periods that correspond to these 32 blood tests. Now, from whenever uh, I've shown this data, many people, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, I want to say raise the outrage that they find it hard to believe that uh, having a higher carbohydrate intake can be correlated with lower glucose. But I think that pro that's probably true if you're eating a lot of junk and uh, eating a Western diet and it's filled with simple, simple carbs. Uh, and, you know, in my case, as we'll see with, with full diet composition in a minute, that, that's not the case at all. And along those lines, we can see that a higher fiber intake is significantly correlated with a lower uh, blood glucose. So I get most of my fiber intake from carbohydrates. I mean, you know, fruits and vegetables um, uh, specifically. So uh, that's probably what's behind the carb carbohydrate uh, correlation with, with glucose. Now also note that a, a, a higher protein intake, a higher average daily protein intake is also significantly correlated with higher glucose. So th my highest protein intake over the past six and a half years has been 147 grams per day. Uh, but for this blood test, it was about 108 grams per day. So I, I've already cut it by 40 grams. 
uh, and going forward, cutting it more uh, doesn't make sense. But what does make sense is going after the biggest fish, uh, biggest potential fish, which would be fat intakes. So let's take a little bit of a deeper look at that. So we can see that my fat intake has been increasing uh, since 2015. And if you look at the plot on the right versus the plot on the left, they look almost identical, although the plot on the left is for glucose and the plot on the right is for my average daily fat intake. And again, remember that each of the circles for fat is the average daily intake that corresponds to a blood test. Now, my average daily fat intake, I've purposefully uh, been increasing it over time so that I could have enough data at low, intermediate, and relatively high values uh, in order to have a data range to, to assess correlations with glucose and other, other biomarkers. Now, for the most recent blood test, I cut my fat intake, total fat from 116 grams per day, which is one of my highest intakes, to 94 grams per day. And along those lines, my blood glucose fell from uh, somewhere closer to actually 100 to uh, about 90, somewhere, I think it was 91 or 92. Now, if correlation uh, is causation for the next blood test, if I continue to cut uh, in this case, down into the 80 to 85 range, uh, that may bring my glucose out of the 90s and into the 80s for the first time in 16 tests. Now, because note that because protein intake is also correlated with higher glucose, uh, I'm going to keep that close to the same uh, 108 grams per day as the last test. And when I do that, that that will then that'll be better a better evaluator of what's going on uh, in terms of fat intakes, potential impact on glucose levels. Now. I'm not just interested in optimizing one biomarker. I want to optimize as many as possible. So if I reduce total fat intake, will, will it improve glucose but make other biomarkers worse? And if so, I may, I may not want to reduce total fat intake. So, all right, so what are the big picture biomarkers? Uh, so that's, that's what's shown there. And uh, they're, uh, basically, they're basically 23 biomarkers and composites of biomarkers that uh, cover m multiple organ systems. So uh, more specifically, they include glucose, homocysteine as, a, as an index of uh, methylation, three markers of kidney function, three markers of liver function, all the major lipoproteins, all the major uh, immune cells, including platelets, red blood cells, and other red blood cell related measures like the uh, average red cell volume and the red blood cell distribution width, RDW, inflammation, so C-reactive protein, and then overall biologic age score with uh, Morgan Levine's phenoage and aging.ai. So when evaluating uh, correlations for total fat intake with these big picture biomarkers, 11 are significantly correlated. So what, what, what can we make of that? If total fat intake is significantly correlated with more biomarkers going in the right direction than wrong, then a higher fat intake, daily fat intake may be optimal. And for me, I, I can't suppose that this is true for, for other people without actually seeing what their data is. So to assess what, if they're going in the right or wrong direction, how did these biomarkers change during aging and what's their association with all-cause mortality risk? So I'm only gonna cover a couple of these in the interest of time, but if, again, if you're interested in more info about uh, further details about each of these biomarkers and how they change during aging and with all-cause mortality risk, yeah, I've got that data on my YouTube channel. So let's start with the easiest one, which is glucose. Here we're looking at uh, average fasting glucose plotted on the y-axis against, uh, against age. And for both men and women, in this case, I've highlighted the data for men as it directly applies to me, we can see that glucose levels increase during aging. Uh, also, relatively higher glucose levels are significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So in my case, a higher fat intake is significantly correlated with higher glucose, so that's clearly going in the wrong direction, so we give it a red arrow. Now, another easy one to go through are uh, neutrophils, which is shown here. So we've got uh, levels of neutrophils on the y-axis plotted against chronological age with data for men in green and data for women in blue. And for men, it's pretty straightforward. Neutrophil levels increase during aging. For women, there's more variability, uh, likely related to pregnancy. And I, along those lines, I have that data in my uh, neutrophil video on my YouTube channel. Uh, but nonetheless, the data for women increases uh, pretty consistently after 55. And then similarly, uh, neutrophil levels, relatively higher neutrophil levels are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So when starting with uh, two to 3,000 neutrophils per microliter there as the reference, we can see that having relatively higher levels than that, again, is associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So in my case, a higher fat intake is associated with or significantly correlated with higher neutrophils. And when considering the aging and all-cause mortality data, that's going in the wrong direction. So we give that a red arrow too. So just using that same analysis, uh, a higher fat intake is significantly correlated with seven biomarkers going in the wrong direction. So glucose, blood urea, nitrogen is shown there. Neutrophils, the percentage of lymphocytes, which is shown there. Monocytes and platelets. Now, one biomarker that's actually going the right direction, so a higher fat intake is correlated, significantly correlated with a lower MCV, so the average volume inside of a red blood cell, 
And that's going in the right direction because lower MCV is found in youth and um, relatively higher MCV is associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. And these are in big studies. Uh, so, um, so that's going in the right direction in terms of higher fat being better for that, potentially being better for that biomarker. Now, there are three debatable biomarkers, uh, including AST, which is a, a specific for a liver, for the liver, but it's also found in other tissues. And I say it's debatable because if you go by the all-cause mortality data, uh, relatively lower is associated with a lower all-cause mortality risk. But when I do a biomarker versus other biomarkers, so AST versus these other 23 biomarkers, uh, having a little bit higher AST is actually correlated with more biomarkers going in the right direction than wrong. So that may be a green, it, it, it may be, uh, 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 sorry, it may be, uh, it may, uh, lower is better, so it would be uh, green, but then in my data, it, it may be red. So, uh, so yeah, debatable. And then uh, similarly for LDL, both lower and higher, it had been reported in studies to be associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. But when I do a biomarker versus biomarker analysis, having relatively lower is uh, seems to be better for my biomarkers, correlated with more going in the right direction than wrong. So this also may be a, uh, a red because uh, higher fat is correlated with higher glute, significantly correlated with higher LDL. And then similar story for red blood cells. So higher is found in youth and uh, lower is, uh, uh, you know, they decline during aging and, and lower is associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So superficially that higher fat is correlated with higher red blood cells would seem to be positive, but when using a biomarker versus biomarker analysis, it's possible that there is such a thing as too high, even within the range. So um, this potentially is also a red. So even without the debatable biomarkers, we've got uh, definitively seven that are going in the wrong direction of the 11. So from that, I conclude that a higher average daily fat intake is significantly correlated with more of the big picture biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. And then along those lines, beyond the correlations with the glucose, this explains why I reduced fat intake for my latest blood test and correspondingly increased my intake of higher carbohydrate containing foods. So what does the rest of the diet look like? So this is gonna be my full macro and micronutrient composition that corresponded to the last blood test in 2021. So a little bit less than 2,400 calories. We already saw my protein intake, full breakdown of fat intake, uh, full breakdown of carbohydrate intake. And just, I'm gonna highlight some key notes. Note that I averaged 86 grams of fiber a day, which is 3X the RDA. And that's intended to optimize the gut microbiome. Um, and then I keep an eye on uh, total fructose and, and uh, total fructose intake. So sucrose is fructose divided by two. So when you sum that, that's the total fructose intake. That's because a relatively higher fructo fructose intake is significantly correlated with lower HDL in my data. So this is actually a relatively low amount of fructose for me as I can eat you know, tons of fruit. It's, uh, I'm a fruitaholic, I can eat that stuff all day. So I've gotta be careful with that based on my HDL correlation. And then full vitamin breakdown. And again, you'll notice that most of this is way higher than the RDA. And one of the benefits of this approach is that I'm not just going after optimizing blood biomarkers, but in doing that, I'm getting to closer towards a personalized diet that is you know, optimal based on the blood biomarkers. So it's like a two-way street of optimization, both blood biomarkers and diet. So some key notes here, you can see the carotenoid abundance with each of those five individual carotenoids. Uh, vitamin C intakes that are uh, way higher than the RDA. And one reason for that is because there's a published dose response for higher blood levels of vitamin C with all cause, reduced all-cause mortality risk. Uh, similarly, vitamin K, an adequate intake is about 100 micrograms per day. So for this blood test, that was 17 times that. And there's published data, and again, I have a video on that on my YouTube channel where uh, vitamin K intakes greater than 1,000 micrograms per day may be optimal. And then in terms of minerals, there's a full breakdown. Just as a key highlight, you can see my selenium intake, which is also uh, about three times higher than the RDA. And one reason for that is there are published studies showing that up to 200 micrograms per, per day may be optimal. And, and in terms of the rest of the diet, so I showed the first 26 foods in terms of abundance. So here's the remaining 26 foods in terms of uh, how much of it I ate, their average intakes over the 42 day period that corresponded to blood test number six. And I should mention, I have a video uh, on this uh, you know, on YouTube, but I, for, for some reason I didn't include uh, that I had Nutella. Uh, so for every blood test, uh, I basically, after the blood test is over for that day and the day after, if I'm going to splurge on some junk, that's, that's when I do it. And then I basically shut it down for the rest of the blood test, uh, period, you know, so I didn't eat any other junk for the 40 days after, uh, having it on the first two days, um, that corresponded to this blood test. So four grams of Nutella per day is, is for a 42 day period. That was about 160 grams over two days. 
in conjunction with the peanut butter. Uh, so I made homemade Reese's peanut butter cups, uh, or not really homemade. I just mixed those two together to make that. All right, so diet isn't the only factor that can affect blood biomarkers and biological age. So what about supplements and fitness? And a big question I get is when I show these data, people think I'm taking, you know, purported semolytics, you know, like NMN, NR, or other, other you know, uh, metformin, rapamycin. So what, what about supplements and uh, cardiovascular fitness metrics? So in terms of supplements, I was diagnosed uh, as being hypothyroid more than 20 years ago. So this is prescribed. I'm taking 137 and a half micrograms per day of levothyroxine. And then in terms of other supplements, uh, all I take is, uh, well, vitamin D in the winter. I didn't include that there, but that should be there. Uh, for this blood test, it was uh, methyl B12, uh, 1,000 micrograms per day, and that was once every three days. Uh, but that's it for supplements. No other, no, no NMN, no rapamycin, no metformin, none of that. It's all diet and exercise. So what about fitness related stats? So in terms of body weight, I'm 155 pounds. And again, I weigh my, myself every day too in the morning. Uh, so about 70 kilograms. And then my resting heart rate in terms of cardiovascular fitness, resting heart rate is 47, about 47 beats per minute. And heart rate variability is about 50 milliseconds. So what are those, what are those metrics and why are they important? So the resting heart rate is pretty easy uh, to define. It's the number of heartbeats per minute while at rest and the fitness tracker that I wear records that automatically. So it takes away the human error in measurement. So is to, when seeing these numbers, let's put into perspective, is cardiovascular fitness contributing to my relatively youthful biological age? So first let's look at the aging data for resting heart rate. And this is using Whoop, I wear Whoop, I'm not sponsored by them. Other fitness trackers do you know, a similar thing by looking at a resting heart rate, heart rate variability. I'm not here to promote them or any other, any other brand. So when looking at this data, which goes from 20 to 50 years old, we can see that the resting heart rate increases during aging for both women in red and men in blue. So based on my chronological age, I should expect to have a resting heart rate of about 56 beats per minute. But in contrast, I'm at the other end of that range, 47.2, which one could posit would be youthful based on extrapolation. So is a low resting heart rate though associated with health? So to assess that, we can look at all cause mortality risk against the resting heart rate. And this is a meta-analysis of 46 studies that included more than 1.2 million subjects. So we can see that when compared with the resting heart rate of 45, which was lowest all cause mortality risk, as the resting heart rate goes away from that, all cause mortality risk significantly increases. So that would, see, that would suggest that my data of 47.2 may be youthful and associated with health, but there's a but in this story. So whereas the WHOOP data only went up to 50, this is data for Fitbit users. And we can see that uh, in agreement with the WHOOP data, uh, resting heart rate does indeed increase up until about 50 for both women in green and men in blue. But after 50, from 50 to 85, now we can see that resting heart rate uh, decreases during aging. So how can we know if a uh, relatively low resting heart rate, in my case, is indicative of health or low because of aging? So uh, looking at data for heart rate variability can provide more insight about cardiovascular fitness. So what is HR HRV? So the simple definition is that it's the variation in time in between successive heartbeats. So for example, if your heart rate is 60 beats per minute, the assumption is that it beats exactly once every second, but that's not true. It can be 0.9, 1, 1.1, 1 .1, you know, and that would give you the same one beat per minute average, but there is variability in the time in between beats. And that's what's shown here. So based on these times in between beats, we would get a heart rate variability of 67 milliseconds. And this is using the RM SSD method in, in case anybody wants the uh, details on that. All right, so how does the HRV change during aging? So that's what's shown here. And again, this is WHOOP data. Uh, now it goes up to 65 for some reason. But what we can see is that when looking at the high end of this range, so starting in youth, uh, where 20 year olds have values of about 110, they get knocked in half, about half to 65 year olds. Similarly, that happens to the median values and that also happens to the low end of this range. So it should be pretty clear that uh, HRV declines during aging. So what about my data? So for the last test, my average HRV every day, my average daily was 50.3, which would put me for my chronological age somewhere there. Now note that the median HRV for my chronological age is somewhere around 42. So uh, in, to answer the question, you know, is my low resting heart rate uh, good or bad? Is that the aging or is that youthful? Uh, in my case, resting heart rate is relatively low in conjunction with a heart rate variability that is higher than the median for my age at worst, or at the low end of the range for a 25 year old. So there are two situations, low, heart, low resting heart rate, high HRV, which are found in youth, and then a low resting heart rate and, and a low heart rate variability, which are found in older adults. So to address that question, I'd posit that my data is more representative of youth 
because if my average heart rate variability was below the median for my age, then I that, that would suggest that the, my uh, low resting heart rate would be in conjunction with uh, a low heart rate variability would, would be indicative of poor cardiovascular fitness, but that doesn't seem to be the case based on these data. Now, similar to uh, the blood test stuff, this is only you know the data that corresponds to one test. How's my data since 2018? And I, I say since 2018, because I started tracking this stuff uh, in uh, August of 2018. So I have more than 1200 days of data for both resting heart rate and heart rate variability. So first, the resting heart rate data. So, and each, each dot corresponds to one day. So uh, just to delineate that. So in 2018, uh, my average resting heart, heart rate was about 51 beats per minute. And note, note that I wasn't inactive at any time uh, during, during this journey. I mean, I've always, uh, you know, strength trained two to three times a week, walk 10 to 15 miles a week. Um, so I didn't go from sedentary to fit. So I've always been relatively fit. So uh, in 2019, I reduced the resting heart rate down to about 49 to about 48 in 2020, and then to 47, closer to 47 in 2021. And we can assess these cha these uh, differences when compared to 2018 using uh, two sample t-tests. So we can see that uh, based on the uh, t-test, the p-value, uh, each year since 2018, I've significantly reduced it, uh, re you know, yeah, relative to 2018 value. Uh, so it's a statistically significant uh, reduction for resting heart rate for each year when compared with 2018. So is it going in the right or wrong direction? It's a cumulative thing, not just one, one, you know, for one blood test, as I showed before. So again, we go back to the how uh, it changed, how resting heart rate changes during aging. So first up to 50, we can see that resting heart rate increases during age. So at least I've resisted the age related increase for resting heart rate. But then the same question arises, how do we know that it, I'm not on the declining age related decline for resting heart rate? So to assess that, let's take a look at heart rate variability since 2018. So I started off in 2018 uh, with about four months of data with a uh, heart rate variability of 47. I increased it in 2019 to 56, further increased it in 2020 to about 58. And then I had a little bit of a dip in 2021 to 52. And each of these uh, years, each of these data for each year is significantly higher than 2018. So I've been able to uh, significantly increase heart rate variability each year since 2018. So to answer that question, how can we know if the declining resting heart rate is indicative of better or worse cardiovascular function? Uh, let's go back to the data for how heart rate variability, variability changes during aging. And then when looking at the data for my chronological age, so this three year period from 45 to 48 or up to about 49, that 12, uh, 1200 plus day average is about 54 milliseconds, which is higher than the median for my age. So if the resting heart rate uh, a reduction that I've had over this three plus year period was in conjunction again with a relatively low heart rate variability that would suggest worse cardiovascular function, but that does not seem to be the case for me. So that suggests I've been able to improve my cardiovascular fitness at least since 2018. But note that it's not all sunshine. Uh, in 2019 and 2020, I had higher heart rate variabilities. So um, that shows that there's room for improvement, especially since I had a little bit of a dip in 2021, even though 2021 was better than 2018. So then the big question going question going forward is, you know, is the 2021 data the sign of a decreasing cardiovascular uh, fitness and 2022 is going to have a lower heart rate variability or will I reverse this trend and get it back to 2019 2020 to get at my highest levels. Alright, so that's all I've got for now. Um, there are lots of places to find me online, including on Patreon uh, and in, with that uh, I'm ready for questions. Okay, wow, that was awesome. What a what an incredible sort of like yeah, uh, outlay of data and just like so meticulous too. I just I just love it. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you once again, um, Mike, for for coming in and speaking. Uh, maybe we'll get to a couple questions, but um, yeah. But before I do that, actually, I, I want to make sure that we ask you know the question that we ask all our our speakers. Um, you know, in the spirit of service here at On Deck, is there anything that we can do to to help you? I know you mentioned some things on on the last slide, but uh, I just opened that up for you as well. Yeah, I, I mean, Patreon's a good spot. Uh, it's a growing community there, so that's probably the top. But uh, if you want to know more about uh, any of the things that I presented, I've got further detailed analysis with all, approaching 100 videos on my YouTube channel. So that's another place to get some pretty pretty solid content. Um, those are probably the two top self promotion, uh, yeah, places to go. Okay, awesome, great. So everyone, check out uh, uh, Mike's stuff on YouTube and also his Patreon. Okay, great. So we have a couple of questions. Um, uh, Carl uh, asks, do you do time restricted eating? 
That's a good question. Yeah, I do. And uh, the thing is, so I, I try to stop eating all of my food. So I wake up uh, between 4 and 6 a.m. So I basically start eating as soon as I wake up. And uh, I stop eating by 3 p.m. on most days. On the weekends, it's about, probably about 2 p.m. Some days, it's about 1 p.m. I don't notice a difference in the blood biomarkers when I time restricted, you know, when I do TRF. I don't, I don't notice a difference there, but I do it mostly for an improvement in sleep quality because I'm eating such a high fruit and vegetable diet, which is a lot of water, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables are water abundant. So uh, I used to have a, a really bad problem of eating two to three hours before bedtime. And again, normal food, fruits and veg fruits, vegetables, all the things that I just showed that I ate. And I'd wake up to pee two, three, four times during the nighttime. And I'd wake up in the morning just feeling terrible. So by doing this, this gives, this gives me, you know, six to seven hours before, before I go to bed with enough time to, you know, use the bathroom before, which limits my nighttime awakenings, which leads to better sleep quality. So um, for that reason, TRF is, is the major reason why, why I include that. But also the, I may get the benefit of, you know, uh, you know fasting may drive the... Um, longevity promoting effects of a calorie restricted diet and i'm mildly cr um depending on what you define as my ad lib intake so um you know maybe there's secondary effects there in terms of longevity we'll find out right we'll find out over the next 70 70 plus years if the trf also impacts that so okay awesome your uh, your uh, gi track is uh is very impressive for uh 85 grams of fiber per day in a you know in a only half the day, half the 24 hour period. So I, I don't know if everyone could do that. Um, and probably you couldn't do the one meal a day thing. That some people really like to do and maintain that quantity of fiber is my guess. I, I've done, I mean, I've done it as one meal a day. I used to eat, uh, I used to fast all day and then, you know, do OMAD from six to 9 PM at night. So it's, it's doable. I mean, granted in the beginning, it was, you know, a tight trade up, I had to work my way up to it, but, um, and there are certain foods that aggravate my GI tract that I have to stay away from or minimize. So I think if you find, you know, uh, foods that you can tolerate that don't cause mo more GI distress than, than can potentially impact the blood biomarkers, I, I think it's easily doable. But that said, I wouldn't recommend doing that, what, replicating my diet as an approach for everybody. You know, I do this because having a higher fiber intake, even as high as that, is significantly correlated with more of these big picture biomarkers going in the right direction than wrong. And I actually titrate, I'm consistently titrating how much omega-3, how much omega-6, how much saturated, how much saturated fat from dairy, how much saturated fat from things like coconut butter uh, to, to optimize the blood biomarkers. Uh, but also by evaluating them both, I can see how the diet is correlated with the blood biomarkers. So if more things are going in the wrong direction than right, I get towards a more precise amount. So. For someone, it, for for some people, eating a very high fiber diet may be correlated with more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. I'd say don't do it then. It's not for you. you follow your own data. So, okay. awesome, awesome. Um, Aaron, do you have a question? Uh, you can come off me, or I can read it for you. Sure. Hey, Michael. Uh, so, is there an online database for all the biomarkers? Um, with age correlation somewhere, I, like not so for for aging AI, what you do there is you put in your a whole list of information and then they just throw it through a black box and then they spit out some number to you. But is there raw data like is there just like a database somewhere of raw data for co changes over time of all, any and all measured biomarkers? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, is yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So the, the, the direct answer is no. Um, okay. I, I hate to say I'm the first to, to start to look at this stuff, but I'm probably one of the first to uh, start to try to organize that. And uh, on my YouTube channel, I mean, if you just do a search for the biomarker of interest, I've, uh, I basically go after the largest. So I, I do comprehensive literature reviews and then basically put in the videos the most representative data. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm going after very large studies, you know, at, if they exist for other things like uh, MCV, maybe there aren't studies of 10,000 people where we've got MCV published data, but for each of these major biomarkers, yeah, I've got that on my uh, YouTube channel in terms of, in terms of age related changes and changes with all cause uh, mortality risk. Um, okay, we're gonna need that at some point. So I'll try to, I'll see if, if that can be pushed into the current project. Morgan mentioned NHANES, what's NHANES? 
It's the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Okay. Cool. By the way, hi, Aaron. I remember, <laughs> yeah. I remember Discord. I haven't forgotten. No problem. It's been a while. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Um, Brad, did you want to come off mute and ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure. It's all the same. Um, yeah, thank you, Dr. Lesker. And that was really incredible um, to do all that guinea pig work for all of humanity. Um, do you have the raw methylation data on yourself from those uh, biological age tests that you've taken up to this point? Yeah. Or so uh, I, I do. I have, I have data for two tests, but I'm not ready to present it yet because I want to have more data. And, and when I start presenting the epigenetic data, I want to have it with correlations with not just the blood biomarkers, but diet. But yeah, fortunately, I reached out to the uh, Horvath Group and the Koch Foundation. I don't know if they're on the call now. And uh, yeah, they agreed to measure at least two samples um, using all of their epigenetic tools. And uh, we may actually uh, be working together to uh, provide epigenetic analysis every time I do the other blood tests. So uh, I'm pretty sure there isn't published data for you know Levine's phenotypic age and aging.ai and how that even compared. Well, there is some data, but at least at the end of one level, I don't think there's any published data. So it'll be interesting to see how the epigenetic data with more tests looks in correlation with these other blood-based biomark uh, biomarker metrics. Yeah, wow, well, fascinating. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, and this is a bit more in the weeds maybe than most, so I apologize to some ears. But um, just to throw a potential wrench in the works down the line, um, I don't know if people are thinking about this this much, but uh, the clocks that are um, trained on chronological age, I know sometimes have diminished returns with regards to their all-cause mortality. So that might be something if you're, if anyone's using that as a golden standard to sort of keep in mind going forward, but that's that's just a ongoing problem in the field, I think. Yeah, and Morgan, Morgan just uh, noted that too. Yeah, I mean, they are noisy. Uh, so that's another, you know, and I'm a big fan of the epigenetic uh, clock approach, uh, but at some point, the noise, you know, the variability will be reduced, uh, and I'm definitely going to integrate that, you know, as potentially in a higher level to, uh, you know, optimize everything. And, but in contrast, most people, I'd say, you know, are not thinking about these blood-based biomarker tools, um, which is disappointing, uh, you know, because they, you know, these biomarkers have been studied for 50 to 100 years plus, depending on the biomarker. So it's well known how they change during aging. Um, and with all cause mortality risk, whereas for the epigenetic clocks, even that it's still being uh, discovered. All epigenetic, epigenetic clocks aren't the same for the predictive ability with chronological age or all cause mortality risk, or even which aspects of aging that they're even measuring. So, um, but like I said, I'm a big fan of that approach and uh, even multi omic uh, based clocks. Um, so I've got my eye on that stuff too. I'm not just trying to stay in one box, the blood based biomarkers forever. I'm, I'm always trying to look how to branch out and improve. Yeah, that was very informative. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Actually, I had a question to, to segue on to that. Do you do any other sort of like functional measures that you, you track over time as well? Or, uh, and also you mentioned something about sleep too. Yeah, I track, I mean, uh, strength, you know, I have a pretty standard uh, fitness workout, you know, compound movements. So I'm, uh, I, I'm always paying attention to physical function there. Uh, but cognitive function, someone was asking me about that, you know, and I mean, that's hard to gauge. I mean, basically someone you could, you could tell by, I don't know how someone talks. You can, you can hear it over time. I don't know. Maybe people can listen to my YouTube videos, you know, a couple years ago versus now and hear a change. I don't know, but yeah, I do track sleep. Uh, there is some, uh, decent comparison with the gold standard for sleep polysomnography with my fitness tracker with, uh, slow wave sleep and total sleep. Um, how good that actually is, I'd say debatable. It's still an evolving field and very small studies too. So, uh, but I do track that stuff. I don't try to optimize it so much anymore these days based on changing my diet to optimize sleep. I find that again, the TRF does the best to improve sleep quality and even extending potentially my uh, slow wave sleep, which uh, declines during aging. Uh, yeah, I'm tracking all the stuff that I mentioned, physical, physical strength, uh, flexibility, mobility, balance, all those things because I don't want to be 80 and I, you know, can't bend down and tie my shoes or, you know, uh, or, or move because mobility it declines during aging too. Uh, but yeah, sleep and, and physical fitness too. Those are big aspects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in terms of like, you know, just in the name of science, doing all this tracking and, and biological 
you know, optim age optimization. Have you ever been tempted to, you know, try some of the, the more uh, esoteric interventions, I guess, like, uh, I don't know, like metformin or, or rapamycin and see what happens to the, to the biomarkers? Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not opposed to these purported senolytics. I'm not opposed to it at all. I just, I think uh, targeted need. So for example, here, here in the summer, I, I try to get as much sunlight, full body exposure as possible so that I can actually have my skin make vitamin D, but in the winter it's impossible, so I have to supplement with it, right? So same thing with B12, uh, methyl B12 reduces my homocysteine by about 20%. If I could do that totally through diet, I would, but it, you know, I have, I don't know, 17 or 18 blood tests, something like that for homocysteine, and it seems to be resistant to all of my dietary changes so far. I've tried other things in the published literature to reduce various things, whether it's liver enzymes or changing my diet, but I, I just, uh, I, you know, maybe there'll come a point when diet and exercise and tweaking and doing my own little in interventions doesn't work anymore. And I have to take something like metformin, but I think most people jump to that right away without going after the foundation of what's causing high glucose in the case of metformin, um, as an example, but even things like rapamycin, so rapamycin is a well-known antifungal, especially against things like candida, candida infections and bloodstream infections with candida uh, increase during aging. So older adults have about a 10 to 15 increased incidence of bloodstream infections with candida versus younger age groups. So if I have a documented bloodstream infection, for sure, I'm going to take rapamycin or whatever the antifungal of choice would be to kill that you know, specific antifungal species. So, uh, and I'm actually considering doing a blood microbiome analysis. There are companies that do that. Maybe I have a subclinical, you know, subclinical amounts of fungi in my blood that shouldn't be there, right? So uh, yeah, I'm I'm open to taking these things, but you know, e but even then, how much to take, and uh, you know, in terms of milligrams per day or micrograms per day, and you know, how often? By using this approach, it, it doesn't have to be okay. This is what the animal studies show. This is what the RT RCT show. In my opinion, all published data has to be evaluated at the end of one level. Even if the study had a million people, 10 million people, 50 million people, and it works on a population-based average. You still have to do the individual testing with ample testing, not one or two tests, maybe 10, 15, 20, an abundance of tests to see if it actually works for you. And then with that said too, is it net beneficial? Is it neutral? Is it detrimental, right? Really taking a scientific approach to whichever supplement, whether it's rapamycin or something else, right? So I wish more people were doing that rather than just based on hope and you know published studies, you know, looking at their own data to see if it's actually beneficial. Um, so that's how I would do it. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And I think, I think that's something that we, we can all take to heart, like, you know, in terms of actually measuring in a meticulous way, you know, in a scientific way. And I, I really enjoy that. Um, obviously it's a little hard to do, uh, here in Canada, but, uh, I think in the U S it's a lot easier to get these blood tests. Um, and it's, it's also tedious, right. And time consuming to do the correlations on my own. It's time consuming. I should say I'm working with one company right now, I'm, I have plans in mind to develop my own company to make it easier to do this for other people. So uh, eventually this will be much easier to do, whether it's through me or other people doing it. Okay, awesome. Looking forward to that. Okay, so I'd just like to thank Michael uh, for, for giving an amazing talk again, you know, spending his time to answer all our questions. It's fantastic, learned a bunch. And uh, yeah, um, hopefully we can have you back sometime in the future. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, awesome. Nathan. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michael. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.